Thank you for tuning in for the first episode of Transformation by Design podcast, specifically intended for all of you coaches, mentors, teachers, and educators out there who want to perfect your craft and empower all of you students and clients to create a lasting transformation in their life. I'm truly excited to welcome Peter Sage, who is my own personal mentor and a man I admire a lot and has created tremendous influence in my life ever since I found his work some time ago. I've been following his work. I'm part of his mentorship forum, which has been a tremendous positive influence in my life and just opened me to new realizations. And that's why I brought him here today to share with us all of his insights, wisdom, and knowledge that he acquired through the years working as a trainer for Tony Robbins and helping people from all walks of life to transform themselves, their life, and to create an amazing, extraordinary life, including his own, because it's as colorful as the colors on the rainbow. So well, uh, welcome, Peter. It's good to have you on the show. And I want to oh. open the show with the first question, which is what got you into coaching, teaching, facilitating transformation for others? How did you get into it? Great question. First of all, thank you for inviting me, Martin. It's, it's a real honor to be the first guest. And I love what you're doing with the actual focus because there are a ton of people out there that have, have gone into the coaching and, and mentoring and facilitation market because the world needs people right now. So if I have the ability to share something that can help people help other people, then yeah, of course, it's an honor to come on. And you've been a, a great example of somebody who showed up in terms of using the work and applying what you learn to actually make it happen. So it, was a, it was an honor to say yes and come on board. So thank you for that. But back to the other question, you know, what got me into coaching and helping? Well, a few different parts to that. Uh, for a start, I think everybody who gets into personal growth or who who is called by personal growth is obviously on their own journey. And just like with you know, most of the things we do in life, as we learn something, we want to share it with others if it gives us a positive impact. And whether that's learning about you know, a new restaurant we're, ex we're excited to eat at because it was so great, or a movie that we you know, went to see, or a technique we learned that helped transform somebody's life. There is an innate part of the human condition that is lit up that rewards us biochemically, emotionally, spiritually, when we benefit others. It's part of the rule set, which is why everything in nature grows and contributes or it's taken out of the food chain. So part of getting into being a coach was I was learning personal growth from the age of 17. That's one of the things I, I credit most of my colorful past and uh, uh, adventures with, the fact that I've been in this industry now for over three decades. And when you learn something you want to teach it, I was originally teaching it to my staff. I would always, on Monday mornings, I would always have staff training and basically teach them what I learned the week before, either listening to tapes or reading books or attending seminars. And that had a massive impact in my business. But I started getting into paid coaching and paid mentoring for a pretty simple and commercial reason. I was tired of giving free advice. And yeah, not just from a selfish perspective, but from a place of if you give free advice, very few people value it. And we see that a lot with coaches. We see coaches reflect their own sense of self-worth by being afraid to charge the value of the transformation because they're linking yeah, what they're doing to a sense of self-worth. And therefore, if they don't believe they are worth a certain amount of money, premium, high ticket, or they don't believe you know, anyone else therefore would pay that because it's them representing and who am I? I don't have 20 qualifications and you know, I haven't coached billionaires and all of this kind of BS that they tell themselves to justify a lack of self-worth. And so you know, getting involved in a coaching business for me was really about getting tired of giving free advice and getting tired of giving advice that people weren't valuing because they didn't pay for it very much, if anything. So that, that's really what got me started many years ago. And of course, part of that is that the more you teach something, the more you learn it from a different angle that deepens your own levels of awareness. 
Wonderful. Yeah, it, it definitely resonates with me having skin in the game, especially when clients and so on. Yeah, it's hard to appreciate the value of something you get handed without asking for. Yeah. Let's continue on with the next question. Who are your most influential mentors that you learn the most significant and empowering information that allowed you to create transformations in others? I, I think most people's biggest mentors are clearly their parents or the, the caregivers that were around when they were growing up. Now, some people may disagree with that because they say, yeah, but my dad was an alcoholic or my mom was like abusive or my you know, stepdad was never there or whatever it may be. But that's also a very strong form of mentorship. Uh, we learn just as much from the examples of who we don't want to become as those that surround ourselves with examples of who we do want to become. So acknowledging that kind of takes the excuse away, which a lot of people are in these days that I find, which is the international epidemic of let's blame my parents for why my life doesn't work. So my parents, I mean, I was very fortunate in that regard. Yeah, I had two loving parents. We had a, a fairly stable family environment uh, up until, yeah, I was probably 27 when my parents actually divorced, uh, at which point I, I bought the family home and I bought them a house each to move to, which uh, yeah, was uh, uh, one of the proudest things I did as a son. So not, not your typical kind of parent, yeah, sort of uh, child relationship. But through the years of growing up, looking back, because very rare do we see the lessons in real time, especially at that age. It's only on reflection sometimes in the rearview mirror of life that we can point the pieces together, or as Steve Jobs would say, join the dots uh, in, uh, in reverse. So for me, one of the things that my parents certainly gave me as a gift, even though I didn't recognize it at the time, was the gift of tolerance for other people's points of view. Uh, something we don't see a lot of these days in the current climate yeah, of polarized thinking. Certainly not something we see uh, on uh, any decent amount of on you know, networks like Facebook, which is you know, more of a, a, a social hand grenade than a social network. But instead, yeah, when I say tolerance, my father was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. He was very much a practical, pragmatic, proud kind of guy, you know, born in 1940s, yeah, young kid in World War II, remembers the bombs dropping. Yeah, it's it's different era. Uh, my mother, uh, sorry, my dad was born, yeah, dad was born in 36, mom was born in 44. And my mother was actually far more into the other side of that. She was uh, originally a trainee nun when she met my father. She was very much ascribed uh, her life to the Catholic Church. She became a special minister. She was uh, actually, before she passed away, was given a, a letter and an apostolic blessing from the Pope, which, uh, Pope Benedict at the time. So a fairly significant, prominent figure in her local parish, etc. And my father, obviously, completely different world. But my father never um, judged my mother for that. She could put up whatever religious statues around the house and religious pictures and whatever. That was her thing. And he was happy for her to have her thing. If her friends came over, he used to call them the God Squad. If the God Squad came in, he'd go down to the pub. But they were welcome in his house and they did whatever they did and yeah, all of that stuff. And on the other side, my mother would never try to force her religious views or have any level of imposition to try to transfer her model of the world onto my dad. For a start, she'd probably know what kind of impact it would have, which would be zero. But they lived in diametrically opposed realities when it came to some of the highest levels of understanding, I use spirituality, some of the big questions, why we're here, who are we, all of that stuff, and cohabited and were very harmonious in that regard for many, many years. So looking at that, uh, and as a great example uh, for my mother, strong Catholic gave me the opportunity to choose my own entry point into religion rather than tell me to be a Catholic. And because all of my friends at school when I was 10 years old were getting confirmed into the Church of England, I chose to do that. Not because I understood the difference, but that's what my friends were doing. At 10 years old, you do what your friends are doing. And my mother was perfectly okay with that. And looking back, that's, that's a massive lesson. You know, you, you struggle these days to have two people in a household 
that have harmony if one thinks they should wear a mask and the other doesn't. If one thinks they should vote Labour and the other thinks they could, should vote Conservative or not, or Republican or Democrat or fill in the blank. Right? It's like that for me gave a real open level uh, or a, a practical lesson in tolerance. So my parents would have to be number one in terms of mentors at that level. Uh, and then there's the usual suspects. As you mentioned, I, I spent a decade and a half yeah, working around Tony Robbins uh, as an experienced trainer in his environment and really having a really good grounding in understanding people and human behavior and intervention at psychotherapeutic levels. But I would yeah, have to say, and I'm on record many times as saying it, the biggest mentor I had in personal growth has to go to one man, and that is George Zalaki. And George, bless him, is uh, in his 80s now. Uh, I went to surprise him at his 80th birthday last year. Uh, lives in Knoxville. I'm actually traveling out to see George and his wife, Eloise, in a couple of weeks. And uh, George, I often refer to as the biggest kept secret in personal growth. Now, people credit my work for being different from the mainstream personal development, typical rehashed, same messages, yeah, same book, different cover. Uh, that's the most common feedback I get. I would give that accolade to George. And a lot of my levels of understanding, a lot of my insight into human psychology and human behavior and the metaphors that I, uh, I got came through George. And he is just a legend, more in the multi-level marketing world, but is a, a phenomenal powerhouse of understanding people. And I'm blessed to have uh, 18 years old sat in the audience of one of his seminars. And just like Tony Robbins did with Jim Rohn, I was blown away and you know, very honored to say became, uh, in his own words, as Tony did with Jim, uh, his greatest student and uh, somebody that he's proud to carry on his legacy. And what would you say were the main lesson you learned or the most significant lessons you learned from George? I would say the biggest jaw dropping moment that I had as an 18 year old sitting in the audience of one of George's seminars that I, I could afford the ticket to go. I just couldn't afford uh, to stay anywhere other than sleeping in the car when I got there. And I didn't even have the gas or the petrol, as we say in England, to run the heater in my little mini. And this is before minis were cool, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is like six foot, six foot three. Yeah, I'm like 192 meters and I, yeah, I don't fit in a minute, certainly the old sort. And so I remember being cramped up in this freezing car, not being able to turn the engine on to run the heater that night because I, I wouldn't have enough gas to get home. So that was my kind of starting point. And I remember going in and hearing this guy on the final day, it was a two day event. And what the most jaw dropping moment, Martin, was when he explained and articulated in a very elegant way what I've since sort of uh, talk about, as I'm sure you're familiar with, as goop, yeah, or the good opinion of other people, and the fallacy of how what's going on in everybody else's head that you're projecting doesn't actually exist. And as you know, it's one of the cornerstones of my work. And yeah, I credit that. And to use a metaphor I heard from Tony Robbins one time, you know, when you start off learning to play music, you always start off by playing other people's music. Yeah. You get to a point where you compose your own, obviously, but it's usually influenced heavily by the masters who you studied under. And so I, I credit Tony, George uh, in business. I credit Chet Holmes, my former business partner, yeah, uh, uh, huge on what they were blessed enough for. I was blessed enough for them to give to me. Uh, but George, the biggest moment sitting there in that seminar as an 18 year old, by the way, who at that point, as most 18 year olds are, they're insecure. They're trying to discover their identity and their place in the world. And it's very comparative thinking. And, oh, what does she think of me? You know, the guys are all high on hormones. Yeah, they're desperate to try to prove to the world they're good enough. They're trying to avoid rejection. They're, yeah, all of that stuff. And the realization that nobody else cares anywhere near the point that you're making out that they do was eye-opening for me at that point and so freeing it was like hang on if i'm looking at a girl in a bar thinking i wonder what she thinks of me i actually now know what she thinks of me she doesn't think anything of me she's thinking wow look at that guy i wonder what he thinks of me and to have that exposed at that age 
was just a, you know, a gift because from that point on, and it didn't happen overnight, it was a progressive level of sinking in the awareness and you know, re realizations as I went. To have the ability to walk around completely independent of the good opinion of others, not from a place of arrogance, not from a place of not caring, but from a place of understanding that 80% you know, of people don't care about your problems and the other 20% are glad you have them. And that if I'm walking around thinking that I'm the star of my movie to anybody other than the person who's starring in the movie, i.e. me, I'm in Disneyland. Because everybody else is starring as the star of their own movie and I'm simply a film extra in theirs, which means when I'm not in their scene, they're not thinking about me. And that was a huge, huge turning point, which I was blessed to have at 18 years old. Uh, that's wonderful. Actually, that's one of the major insights I got from you first long time ago when I discovered your work, maybe three, four years ago, it was goop. It was like, wow, this is so profound. Like I never thought of it this way. And it was really impacted me too, because I, I never were very concerned with people's opinion, but now this even gave me a whole different perspective because I always had good confidence or like myself enough to not necessarily care what people's opinion is because it's their opinion. It exists in their head and not mine. It's not for me to be concerned with or poison my consciousness with. Up to this point, what do you think was the most important lesson you had to learn in your life? <laughs> yeah, everybody wants what's the one this, the one that, the most this, the number. There, there, there isn't one because yeah, one of the biggest lessons which the ties biggest, into yes, this. Let's reframe this. We're the biggest. Well, no, but one of the biggest lessons is that context is definitive. Yeah, in other words, what could be the biggest lesson in one area of my life could be completely irrelevant in another. Could be all completely overshadowed in another. All right. So, uh, when I say one of the yeah, what are the biggest lessons? Let's 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 narrow it down to it. Uh, one of the biggest lessons in business. Let's pick that one. Yeah, because my background is way more business than it is anything else. You know, I've been 110% unemployable since I dropped out of school, pretty much. So, yeah, I think my last paid job was when I was 17. And so, uh, for me in business, the biggest lesson was understanding the difference between trying to sell and focusing on adding value. Yeah, if you're trying, I want to build my business. Wrong focus. I want to add value to as many potential customers as I can, right focus. Because then you start to understand money. Money is not a thing. We make it a thing, but the only place in the universe that money exists is in the mind of a human being. So everything else, it's paper with dead people on it. It's you know, hard rocks and shiny metal, pretty much it. Or an algorithm if you go crypto now. You get my point. So to understand that if you're making money a thing and you're off chasing that thing, you're chasing a consequence, which is why most people chase money, they chase their tail. If you go into a gym and chase strength, you're going to chase your tail. Why? You want to be focusing on chasing, adding, you know, lifting weights. Strength will follow. Has to. It's part of the rule set. Now, if you want to focus on trying to be warm by staring at the fire, you're going to get hypothermia. Focus on chopping wood and putting it on there, you'll get warm as a consequence of doing that. It's part of the rule set. Trying to focus on going chasing money and earning a buck, you're going to stay broke pretty much most of your life or at a certain level. Focus on how can I add value, you'll look over your shoulder one day and think, wow, where did that money come from? Because it's a consequence of adding value. And you only get money by adding value for it first, giving something of value for it first. For some people, that's 40 hours a week. Yeah, for others, it's a product or service. You get my point. So in business, uh, one overarching lesson, context is, def is definitive. In business, huge lesson, focus on adding value rather than trying to get something like a you know, quality, quarterly, quarterly sales target. Uh, biggest uh, lesson in relationships, Nobody can ever love you more than you love yourself. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Everybody else is running around. Not everybody, but yeah, a lot of people running around trying to find somebody else to reattach their umbilical cord to because they feel a lack of self-love. Good luck.
Uh, oh, I'm, I feel lonely. I need to meet with somebody because I'm lonely. Great. So you'll attract somebody else who's lonely. Well, what does that do? Well, now you have two people that are lonely that are together. See, pro proximity doesn't fill that gap. You, know, you could be with 100,000 people in the middle of a stadium and still feel lonely. And then we come to, again, biggest lesson in personal growth. Nobody can ever rise above the opinion of themselves. Ties in. It's, yeah, I could go on and on, but you, you get my point. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Actually, the adding value point was something very profound. I learned from you as well by attending your business school last year, which was profound. And also you recommended in one of the conversations, uh, I read the law of success. I actually been listening to it over and over again. And one of the laws by Napoleon Hill, and that he talks about a uh, hundred years ago is rendering more service than paid for. So it's the, pretty much the very same concept. But yeah. with that in value coming from a place of serving others. And then, as you said, when you give things come back, it's just part of the rule set. But very profound in today's economy right now where everybody's being laid off or furloughed due to, due, due to COVID. And yeah, how do you become irreplaceable? Uh, simple. Do more than you're paid for. Oh, yeah. Be, be, make yourself irreplaceable. Make yourself, if the, if the boss has five people to let go of, make sure that yeah, he'd rather step in front of traffic than serve you notice because yeah, you're too valuable to that business. It's not difficult. But if you're clocking off at three minutes to five, if you're doing just enough to basically not get fired, don't expect the universe to reward that with any kind of job security. Good, solid point, solid point for all of us out there. Absolutely. You already mentioned that attending George Zelicki's seminar when you were 18 was a significant impact on you, but was there another one later on in life that you attended a seminar or a course or some other personal development program that you took that had a very significant impact on you? And what was it? What was your main takeaway? Yes. Um, there's obviously many uh, because it's, it's, it's levels of progression. It's like, if you are a spiritual student, it is exceptionally rare. 10 million to one plus, and I'm plucking that figure out of my ass, obviously, that you would have a burst of sudden enlightenment. And makes sense. If you walk into a gym, you don't have a, a sudden burst of muscles. It takes work and it takes the ability to be consistent. And so that transformation is lasting or not taken for granted. But uh, a lot of that overlaid in my journey on personal growth as it does for many. There's not one defining moment or significant emotional event that suddenly ba-boom. But there are certain points that I do remember that you know, did have a larger impact than others. And both of those had to do with um, Date with Destiny, which is Tony's you know, flagship transformation seminar. And first as a participant way back in the 90s. Yeah. And uh, that was where I really discovered some of my old patterns of turning into an overachiever to try to get recognition and love from my parents. And the two-edged sword that that became. Yes, it made me a millionaire in my 20s. But it also gave me an uh, impossible finish line because my inherent drive was always to achieve more. And when I thought I got enough, it's never enough. Yeah, it's like, oh, I'll run to the end of the horizon. Because <laughs> yeah, I can see the end of the horizon. I'm sure when I get there, then I'll, I'll, I'll have arrived. We know that game. So that was profound. And then it was several years later when I was a trainer for Tony. Uh, actually, I was on his leadership program. I wasn't a trainer at that point. Uh, I wouldn't have been a trainer if I'd have still been running this kind of pattern. But now I was on his leadership, like apprentice trainer, if you like. A few years later, and I remember it, it was at um, Hilton Head in... South Carolina, another day with Destiny. And I was, I was there as a, uh, say as an assistant trainer, if you like. And there was something he said that just triggered a realization that threw me for six. Because I remember looking at every single memory of my life at that point and thinking back on every scene that you quote unquote remember or recall. And I realized that none of them were memories. 
They were all constructs. Why? Because I was seeing myself in the scene. Now, that has to be a construct because clearly I wasn't looking at it through anybody else's eyes, but I saw myself in the scene, if you know what I mean. I wasn't looking through my own eyes in the scene in the first person. I was watching it as if I was watching myself on TV. And the reason for that is that all of my filtering, every memory I had was being rendered through the lens of what do other people think of me? Yeah, it's like there was that aspect of still need for approval. Uh, it was, and it was unconscious. But to suddenly be slapped with the self-realization that every single memory I thought I had wasn't even a memory, but it was unconsciously filtered through the fear of not being enough and therefore trying to see how other people see me. I mean, I'd handled the goop thing in terms of being in person. Yeah, you didn't like me? That's, you know, great. Your opinion of me is none of my business. But when I look back in my memory, that, that sticking point, and I think it, I traced it to a time when I was eight years old. And uh, my mom was going to leave me alone in a hotel room. And I, I, I yeah, and there was a comment and like getting into it. It was, a, it was a profound realization for me. And I had to work on that for quite a while. Yeah, a period of months with some of the best trainers and, and other people I was luckily in the environment with before I finally made peace around that. And now when I think back of a memory, I look through my own eyes at the, at the scene. It's not a construct. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's a profound shift in your consciousness and how you experience life and from then on and how you, what choices you choose to make from then on, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely profound. Wonderful. What, did, what do you wish you knew when you first started your coaching and personal development practice working with clients, students, and so on? What was the question, Martin, sorry? What do you, you wish you knew when you oh. first started your, <laughs> your coaching, mentoring, and working with clients, professional practice, and personal development? There's two sides to that. Uh, one is that whatever I think I wish I knew would have then invalidated the lesson I had to get by not knowing it. So there's no regrets on that. But if you ask the question through the lens of if I was talking to somebody who just started out and they asked me for some advice, then uh, that would be a different frame. So looking at it through that lens, uh, I would say that you will attract the kind of client that is designed to reflect back the lessons that you need most. So when you're aware of that, and you know, when you're aware of that, you can embrace it rather than try to use the title or position of coaching as some sort of pedestal to allow yourself to feel significant because yeah, you want your client to think that you've got your shit together. Yeah. When you are hiring a coach, one of the first things you should ask them is what are they working on? And check their reaction. Because if they are shy about admitting what they're working on, that ain't a coach. Yeah, that's a con job. <laughs> and I say that, yeah, not from a place of deliberately trying to mislead with yeah, malintention, but I want somebody who is authentic who's vulnerable, who is open about what it is they're trying to go to the next level. If I go to a, an athlete, even an Olympian, I say, what are you currently working on? They'll tell you. This is the top 1% you know, of the top 1% of the top 1% of the world. I say, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm an Olympian. I don't need to learn anything else. The day they do that is the day they get kicked in the ass by their coach. No. An Olympian at the top of his game will be hiring more coaches to look for that little tweak, that extra little push, that what have you. Now go ask Conor McGregor you know, what he's currently working on, and he's not going to tell you, oh, nothing, I'm already arrived. Of course not. So if, if I was to coach or 
offer yeah, my advice to a, a young coach starting out in, uh, or a coach starting out their business, I'd say that what clients are looking for is a reflection of authenticity. And a lot of people think that they have to have the answer, otherwise their clients will devalue them. And a client will value a lot more by saying, you know something, I hadn't considered that. Let me check into it and I'll come back to you. Now I know I can trust you and you're not trying to BS me by trying to hide behind some, yeah, uh, as I say, position of authority that you're scared of being busted on. Second piece of advice that I would give is that understand your clients aren't buying you. They're buying your certainty in the level of transformation you can give them. And when you're trying to sell yourself as a coach, all that's going to come up is your issues around self-worth. You want to see a area people destroy themselves in it, self-image. You want to see how they expose that, see what somebody charges for their time. Yeah, I've, I've seen coaches say, oh, approach me, say, oh, I'm, I, I charge $150 an hour. I'm thinking of putting it to $175 an hour. What do you think? And I, I, I just put my head in my hands. Uh, I'm like, well, clearly you don't think you're worth it. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be asking me. If you're seeking external validation, if, if can you imagine asking a client that, well, I'm, yeah, how much do you charge? Well, you know, let, let's just have the session and pay me what you think it's worth. So if you don't know how to value yourself, you sure as hell ain't getting my money. That's how a client would think. Yeah, so no. self-worth, understanding that clients, they don't care what qualifications you've got. They don't care what coaching school you went to. They don't care if you're you know, charging by the hour, the minute, the whatever. They don't care. What a client is buying is an amazing outcome in however that is verbalized, whether it's fixing a current problem or getting them to the next level or busting through a glass ceiling or dealing with a, a bullet strike issue like a, an addiction or whatever it may be. They don't care if you do it with timeline therapy, NLP, you know, questions model. They, they don't care if you do it with a backflip underwater. They want the result. So the more you can deliver your certainty around delivering that result, the more they're going to buy into who you are. And if you position yourself as an expert in that, you can command a premium. If not, join the ranks of the people trying to vie for a couple of hundred bucks an hour uh, and see how you get on. And that ties back to your own self-worth again, right? Starting from the self place, working on the self first and then going from there. Because I remember when I first started my coaching practice about a year ago, I didn't have a certificate and so on. I just had the knowledge. I've done all the work on myself and I knew I can help certain men with their issues and I started with about thousand dollars per hour which for the newbie who never even sold his services for some people might sound a little bit extreme but yeah I guess if you have the self worth and you know you can deliver it's it's everything's possible again <laughs> don't sell need... on price don't try to compete on price don't even get focused on price focus on value if you've got a person who's worth a hundred million dollars and they are having a quality of life that is in the toilet because they, you know, their childhood sweetheart ran off with a pool boy and they're now doing a bottle of Jack Daniels a week and 20 grand a night in the casino, uh, then they're not looking for somebody who says, oh, I'll fix that for $500. No. And that's... True case, by the way. You turn around and say, listen, I know exactly how to fix that. I charge $25,000 a month, and this thing's gone in 30 days. Bang, done. That's what I want. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. And then uh, I would say the, uh, the, for the final piece of advice that I would give somebody who's uh, uh, into coaching uh, and, and putting that out, Again, un other than understanding that you know, people buy people, yeah, and they buy the uh, in terms of your certainty around that, not your qualifications around what you're trying to hide behind, yeah, et cetera. Understand that you're going to attract clients that are a reflection of a lot of your disowned parts and be open about what you're working on. 
uh, uh, I would say that if you were to uh, if you were to put across a uh, or uh, a niche that is so ownable that your client knows you are speaking to them. One of the challenges, especially when you start it, is like, oh, I, I want to appeal to everybody. I can help you with your relationships and your weight problem and your, your, your relationship with your boss and blah, 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 all this kind of, forget it. There is no more ability to command a, a generalized offer. Not in today's society where you're competing with 8 billion people that have got smartphones. Yeah, it's just forget it. I'll give you an example here that'll be powerful for everybody listening. There was a, a lady, a friend of a friend, who was into coaching and she was coaching CEOs. And she was making 10, 15 grand a month. And she was doing the normal stuff. She was making enough money to run enough ads to get enough clients to pay her enough money to run some more ads to you know, maintain a certain level of lifestyle, but nothing out of the park. Working hard. She had a, a consult with one of my friends and she changed one word in terms of who she was looking at. And she went to earning 300 grand a month. And the word was gay. Instead of targeting CEOs, she was targeting gay CEOs. Guess what? Now anyone who was a gay CEO knew, oh, this is my coach. They understand me. She's clearly got a formula for being able to help somebody with my particular lifestyle or the issues that crop up as a result of my lifestyle in society, whatever it may be. But that was a profound shift and it was the only shift she made to have a 3,000% you know, increase in her revenue. Uh, so don't try to be everything to everybody. Out of 8 billion people, you could probably do quite well with 100 clients at one time. They're out there. Don't try to be everything, otherwise you're never going to find them. You throw a net out in the ocean, it's got a lot of holes in it. Yeah. Fish will swim through. Whereas you throw out you know, a fly rod with a hook on and a certain kind of bait that appeals just to one kind of fish, you're not going hungry. That's funny. I was just thinking about adding this as an analogy. When you go fishing, you need or use a certain bait to get a certain type of fish because not all fish bites on the same bait. So that's, <laughs> that's great. We're kind of vibing on that. Wonderful. What has been the greatest challenge in your own, in your own personal practice in, in a sense of professional practice, teaching, coaching, and mentoring that you had to overcome and how did you do it? Good question. Again, context is definitive. In my early days, it was self-belief. In my early days as a speaker, for example, you know, as you know, I'm a, a fairly busy uh, public speaker. And um, you know, I'm, I'm actually off. We, we, we've had obviously all the lockdowns and all the rest of it, but I'm, I'm back flying off training in person in three weeks um, all over the world. Uh, but from the age of like 17, 18, when I first started to do little presentations, I was so nervous because I knew in my mind, in my fantasy mind, but I knew that everybody was judging me. Everybody would probably think I what I got to offer was not right. And therefore, I was trying to get as much certainty about delivering value as I could. So I would read my slides. I would get up and look for structure, which completely disconnects you from the hearts of the audience, which is where the true transformation comes from. And so for me, one of the, the hardest things initially was just getting to a point of understanding that, hang on, if I'm going to give my first 10 talks and I know I'm going to suck, <laughs> then do I spend the rest of my life wondering what would have happened if I did, but glad that I didn't include the emotions of, yeah, not good enough, judged, you know, inadequate, inept, uh, embarrassed, all the stuff that you don't want to include and by the way, which only lives in your head, not the actual head of the audience. So do I go throughout my life saying, I'll never be a professional speaker because I couldn't do that. And falling into the trap most of humanity fall into when they sell out their potential, which is basically using the language pattern of, I can't when 
the reality is, oh, I absolutely can. I just won't because I don't feel comfortable including the emotions that I've decided are uncomfortable. Or do you turn around and say, yes, I'm going to suck. Yes, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yes, I'm going to have feelings of embarrassment, not good enough, questioning my own worth, yeah, uh, ridicule, all of that stuff that I'm making up in my head. So how fast can I get to number 11 where most of that has gone? And that decision is one of the hardest for most people because they live this side of possibility. It's the, the origin of the classic Susan Jeffries. You know, feel the fear and do it anyway. And then you realize that it's not actually a ghost. It's a little midget holding up two broomsticks you know, under a sheet, making woo noises. And you turn around and you pull off the sheet and you're like, I'm scared of that. Are you kidding me? Now you can put the midget in a tortilla and eat him. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's not a real fear. So that is a, w w was tough getting to that point. But once you build a reference for it, it gets easier. Uh, are the hardest things? I don't so much in the professional career because you know, I, I can deal with pretty much anything that I've, yeah, you know, I've been, I, I've made enough millions and lost enough millions to have been around the block enough times to, yeah, pretty much have seen done anything you could throw at me. Uh, hardest thing in my personal life, I think, was losing my parents, especially as an only child, especially with no grandparents or any extended family. Um, and but doing it at a time of my life where I was able enough to process it with a level of emotional maturity that even though you feel the grief, you feel the sadness, you're processing it from a cathartic expression that is uh, part of the cycle of growth, not get pinned down into victimhood for a number of years, and use it as a to justify why life isn't fair. You know, too many people do that. As I said earlier, everybody has a story, but most people don't care enough about you to bother to give an opinion about it. And the others are pretty glad you have your story because they don't care about your problems. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, Peter, contributed for your success as a coach, as a mentor, as a teacher up to this point? What would you give credit most to? Or your success up to this point? Persistence and ability to be okay not being perfect. You know, we're all just people. And as I say to many of my students, and you've heard me say it several times yourself, yeah, I'm no special than anybody else. My job is to hold up a mirror to reflect your own greatness. The second you make it about me, you lose the message. The second I make it about me and how good I am to help you, yeah, I need a coach more than you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the, the, the humility of that is something that comes with, with age. You know, in, in my, my 20s, I was so ego-driven and insecure and at pride, nobody can see that. It's the classic denial. Yeah, I, in fact, my 20s, I was actually very humbled by how freaking awesome I was. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah, total pseudo humility. And the universe will provide enough feedback to give you enough flicks on the nose to yeah, coach you out of that at some point, hopefully this lifetime. But yeah, uh, for me, it's, again, it's, it's remembering that yeah, we're all here in the same game to try to help each other and get on. And when we come from a place of surrendering judgment and embracing compassion, tolerance, high conscious states, knowing that we didn't come here to avoid problems, we came to take them on. We didn't come here to be perfect. We came to focus on a direction of travel. Yeah, there is no done. And as, as much as you say, you could ever hit the horizon with a hammer. Yeah, and... and Chill out a little bit, lighten up. We're living in a time in human history that is unprecedented that our ancestors would give anything to even taste, yeah, to live a day for in this kind of level of, of, of existence where yeah, we, we have so many things we take for granted. And again, you go back to you know, the, uh, the health go ahead recently. 
my good friend Clive DeCarp summed it up when he did a study of all of the cancer survivors from stage four to find out what is the commonality. How much vitamin C did they take? How much you know, were they affected by chemotherapy? And got the shock of his life that the number one surviving factor or attributing factor to their survival was gratitude. And when they switched from fear into love, when they came from a place of resistance to a place of acceptance, when they, instead of seeing it as an adversary to try to beat, saw it as a messenger with a gift, you say, well, some gift? Well, yeah, so it's wrapped in some lousy paper. Most people spend their life fighting it and wonder why they succumb to it. But it's simply a messenger. Ask yourself, you know, sit around the same side of the table and say, what are you trying to tell me? And from that perspective, we can learn a lot. Thankfully, hope, well, hopefully, without having to have a stage four diagnosis first. Yeah, it's the type of notification that you can ignore from the universe, right? I like to say that unless you're a saint, there's plenty of, of learning and growth left for you to do here in this game of life. Or if that's not the case, then you'll have been enlightened, ascended, and so on, and probably have disciples. Yep, 100%. How do you approach personal transformation when working in clients with, with, with clients? Do you have a specific framework that you use or system? Going back to what I said about public speaking, when you first start off, you're looking for structure because you're kind of looking for certainty and you kind of need certainty. When, you're, when you get a driving license, you kind of need to be following all of the road signs and all of the you know, 10 to two on the steering wheel and all of the mirror signal maneuver and everything else. At some point, you are way more competent than somebody following that by yeah, having a sense of intuition and understanding and become unconsciously competent about how to navigate and you're not scared about somebody pulling out because you can anticipate all of that kind of stuff. But you can't expect somebody to do that on day one of passing their test. So structure is important. And I've, I've been on record. And I'm a little unfair about slagging off people like you know, Toastmasters, for example. Because what Toastmasters do is exceptionally valuable because it gives people who are scared to death of public speaking a structure to follow, which gives them the certainty. <clears throat> My issue has always been that the, the ability to move people emotionally to take action defines a world-class speaker. And you can't do that if you're stuck in your head following a structure. So it's great to start with. Like ask any woman who dances salsa. If they dance with a guy who is still in his head trying to remember the moves, yeah, he may be technically correct on the moves, but there's no soul. You get a guy who picks them up and whisks them around the dance floor with elegance without even thinking about it because he's practiced enough. It's a different energy. And so when you start off coaching, you have a structure. But you get to a point where you just know or you tune in. So, yeah, and you see Tony's the master of this, obviously, from strategic intervention, unrivaled. And I spent... 40 years plus doing it. So you'd expect him to be, be a pretty much top of the game. Yeah, again, I've always been an entrepreneur first and kind of speaker coach second. But when it comes to being able to help people, I, I tune in. It's, it's automatic. Again, as, as a skydiver, when I first started jumping out of airplanes yeah, for fun or to relax, I would have to be looking at my altimeter to know that, oh, look, it's time to pull my chute. If I'm doing formation work at 4,000 feet, I've got to wave off, turn around, get some space and open my chute. But after you know, 100 or you know, 150 jumps, I just know when it's 4,000 feet. And that's something that most people would be, you know, to start with, are like this. Yeah, because they can't, life depends on it. Same with coaching. One thing I will say, and I learned, again, this from Tony Robbins, so I, again, I, I owe a huge amount to in terms of the original structure that I, I looked at and the six human needs model uh, is stunning. But he said, if you want to get good at working with people, get good at spotting patterns because there's only so many of them. And I took that to heart. It was in 2000 when he said that. And so, yeah, 20 years ago. And so I really started focusing not on the outer world behaviors. It's irrelevant. What's the pattern that's driving it? 
because like going to a chiropractor, uh, if you have a problem you know, with a, a, a tight shoulder or you know, out of balance hip, whatever, you can treat that. But if he makes one adjustment to the spine or one adjustment to, to the hip and everything lines up and now the shoulder gets better because he's treated the cause of that. Now you can try to treat the behavior, which most coaches do, but far more powerful to treat the cause. Otherwise that behavior is going to express itself in some other form of dysfunction. Yeah. Treat the actual problem, not the symptom. And Very few people are trained on how to spot that because they're too busy hypnotized by what the client is pointing to as the pain. That's what I actually noticed in my early days when I was developing my practice or understanding of human behavior, exactly those patterns and the underlying patterns that are driving this behavior that was really significant and still is because I learned from you a lot of those things and these to me are the, the biggest nuggets when you have all these little and you start to layer them down and then you actually not only know them, but you can spot them too, right? Because that's the, the magic key when you can spot them. There's only so many of them and they become yep. predictable because human beings are habitual by design and you know, behaviors preceded by thought and thoughts become habitual based on how the neocortex and midbrain work. So therefore, uh, you can start to predict somebody's behavior based upon observing them for a very short amount of time. And the challenge is most people like to recruit you into their story because they think it's the story that validates their behavior. Yeah. Story is irrelevant. I don't care who did what. I don't care who they did it with. I don't care how many years ago it was. It's all irrelevant. If I look at the pattern and I know how to erase that pattern, that story becomes irrelevant. That story becomes inconsequential in that person's life moving forward. And most of the time, that's about getting them focused off of themselves and onto what they can contribute rather than what they can get and reframing a lot of the experience in a way that serves them rather than serves their victimhood. And again, there's only so many patterns and a good coach will see a lot more than what comes out of people's mouths. Fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. What are the top three tools or techniques you find yourself using most often when working with clients, with your students, with your mentees? Every, everybody has kind of their go-to. Uh, you'll see personal trainers that prefer to work on certain types of, you know, methodology for example yeah, if you have some trainers that are trained in you know high intensity intervals or they'll do pnf stretching versus you know sort of yoga and all of this kind of stuff their thing when i was with the tony robbins trainers everybody had kind of a specialist go-to so for example if uh, when it came to disorders which you know, most of us have if a client was uh or a participant had eating disorders bulimia anorexia, yeah, food dependency, we'd refer them to Sunny, Sunny Kane. Phenomenal. That was her thing. If somebody was a stutterer, yeah, they would send them to me because I, you know, for whatever reason, I would yeah, treat stutterers faster than most of the other trainers because I had my little technique and working. I take people who've been stuttering in speech therapy for 15 years and solve it in 20 minutes permanently because you understand what it is. It's not a biological deformity. It's a mental pattern. So when you know how to rearrange that mental pattern or collapse the triggers up behind it, no big deal. Pretty simple. And they'd look at you like, oh my God, I've had parents walk out of a seminar room saying, what have you done to our son? I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, we spent 15 years and tens of thousands of dollars for an hour a week with a speech therapist, right, which winds me up, by the way. And he's been gone half an hour and just come back and spoke normally for the first time in, in memory. Oh, well, yes, yeah, because, you know, you you, 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 I don't care how good you are. I don't care how fit you are. And I don't care how fast you run. If you're running east looking for a sunset, it ain't going to happen. And so uh, we all had our thing. And it's the same with the techniques. Because techniques are, they're, they're just techniques. Yeah? And there's many good ones around there. You can have timeline therapy. You can have hypnotherapy. You can have NLP. You can have the six human needs model, you can have yeah, uh, gestalt, you can have aspects of dynamic psychotherapy, you can have humanistic therapy, all of that stuff is an array of tools. What I am far more into is what is the fastest 
most permanent level of transformation that somebody can get. Because I don't want you on my couch every week for the next 15 years. You know, I, I don't need that to cover a Mercedes payment. You know, it's like, uh, I'm not being cynical here, but uh, the old models were great to the extent that they were new models. You know, when Freud came out with a lot of his understanding of the human condition in terms of the psychotherapy or dynamic psychotherapy, which is he was kind of the father of, it was groundbreaking. But guess what? So was lobotomizing people at one point. Don't do it today because we've got better ways of doing it. Yeah. Right? right? Yeah. So yeah, electric shock therapy was, yeah, oh, let's give them that because that seems to have worked you know, through some distorted lens of reality. So it's about finding what works for you. There is no one technique. Go to a martial artist or a mixed martial artist. You'll have people that favor grappling versus striking. You'll have people that favor wrestling versus judo. You'll have people that favor you know, different aspects of attacking styles or counter striking. One's not better than the other. What you're comfortable with, what sits with you, what you get proficient with and what you're able to use, yes, you've got an array of tools. And in the Tony Robbins environment, I was required as a trainer to be able to walk into any situation, suicide, drug abuse, stuttering, whatever it may be, it doesn't matter. And I've got, like Batman, 20 tools on my belt. I can pull out anyone that I think is relevant at that time, but of course I've got my go-to tools that I tend to use a lot. Ask a chef. He'll have certain ingredients he keeps going back to to make the food that he likes, that the people like around it. Or he'll have certain cooking styles that he favors rather than other chefs. It's not right or wrong. As long as you're not poisoning anyone, it's, it's okay. Yeah, go win your Michelin star with your recipe. Don't try to copy somebody else's. Make sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So what's your go-to? Do you have a go-to or a favorite one? Well, one of the, 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 the two lenses that I always look through, the first is what level of consciousness is the person operating at? Because that tells me so much about the rest of their life. And are they operating out of a state of consciousness, which is temporary, or is that their predominant stage of consciousness? I.e., are they visiting somewhere and it's dysfunctional, but it's not who they are? Or is it predominantly where they live, not where they're visiting? Right? So if someone's calibrating at anger because they're just generally an angry person, then that's been their habitual thought patterns and it's their go-to to restore significance or to avoid uh, feeling insecure, to puff themselves up and belittle other people. That tells me way more about how this person operates than somebody who's calibrating at fear or desire or yeah, courage or willingness, for example. And that allows me a primary lens of, how I approach and work with that person because getting somebody from yeah, courage to willingness versus getting somebody from, you know, guilt yeah, into desire are two very different strategies. Even if they both have the same story, situation, background, excuses, yeah, lifestyle, problem, whatever. Yeah. So level of consciousness is primary. Then I look at the needs. What is the need structure? What needs are they meeting as a result of their dysfunctional behavior? Or what needs are they avoiding as a result of their dysfunctional behavior? And there's only so many needs. You know, the six human needs model uh, that Tony teaches yeah, comes through a, a lot of the background in psychocybernetics uh, around certainty, variety, love and connection, uh, or you know, love and connection being one. Most people want love. They settle for connection. Uh, significance being a big one, especially for, for yeah, the, uh, the, the masculine energy there. And then obviously the needs of the soul or the needs of the, uh, the, the human condition for being able to have fulfillment, which is growth and contribution. And most people are focused on themselves when they have issues and they're not focused on the growth and contribution. And that's, that's the two primary lenses. From there, it's usually pretty easy to solve issues by recontextualizing the actual relationship to the issue rather than trying to solve the issue. Yeah, again, accurate diagnosis is, is critical. Somebody comes and says, oh, I'm, I, I'm so busy. I need a coach to teach me better time management. And most coaches all say, oh, great, no problem. I've got a great time management skill. Are you kidding me? Within nine nanoseconds, a decent coach should be able to see that that's a symptom uh, and not a cause. Yeah. So 
it could most likely be the fact that they're either a control freak, in other words, they have a high need for significance, uh, sorry, a high need for certainty, beg your pardon. And if they're a business owner, probably their self-worth and net worth are tied together. So therefore they dare risk uh, failure. So therefore they're micromanaging, therefore they're too busy, therefore they think they need time management. Or maybe the other issue is that they're petrified of rejection. They won't say that consciously because you know, they're coming from a, a place of significance, but that's an overcompensation to avoid rejection. So therefore, by saying no to somebody who says, oh, can you just take this on? Or can you, any chance you can do this? Or do you mind? I just need a five minutes to talk, whatever. For somebody to own themselves to a point where, uh, I'm sorry, I'm too busy for that. Some people, that would trigger in them the fear of a rejection response from the person that they are rejecting, right? Oh, what they, if I say no, what will they think? Maybe they won't like me, love me, whatever it is. All unconscious, but prevalent. And so therefore they say yes to too many things. Therefore they think they need time management. But that's treating the, you know, that's treating the shoulder, not the spine. So you teach somebody how to be immune to the fear of rejection. They'll be able to solve their time management issue on their own. Cause now they'll be okay to turn people down when they try to throw something on their plate or a monkey on their back. Get the idea. So yeah, looking at, yeah, what is their level of consciousness? Hmm. What needs structures going on and being able to change the contextual relationship to it rather than the content, which is always a fool's game. Because most people are stressed out because they're trying to change the circumstances of their life rather than trying to change their relationship to the circumstances of their life. When they finally get to understand that outer world follows inner world, they'll give up on trying to force the outcome and realize that, you know, the world tends to rearrange itself perfectly well. Yeah, this is profound. Also, I, I also found out the six the six needs structure or framework to be very powerful from you, and I also discovered through Tony initially, and then the the one that I actually credit you me finding out from was the level of consciousness. And for those of you who are not aware of what we were talking about, uh, level of consciousness in the relationship, or you can take a look at power versus force by Dr. Hawkins and his scale of consciousness, where he explains all the different levels of consciousness and it's based on the emotions and the behaviors that people tend to demonstrate in accordance to their level of consciousness. So that kind of like puts them in a very predictable space of behaviors and so on so that that's 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 great that's very profound welcome thank you what do you find to be the most significant challenge that most of your clients struggle with during the process of transformation well whenever you're working with a client what seems to be the greatest challenge that they face with well whatever the ch challenge is it's it's usually overestimated. It's again, the story they tell themselves about the challenge is the biggest challenge a lot, a lot of the time, you know? And yeah, for me personally, you know, um, I would say the biggest challenge, the, the, the number one rule of coaching is that if you want something more for your client than they want it for themselves, you're wasting your time. Yeah, that's, that's it again. They, they don't have a, the willingness to let go of secondary gain from their problem is a problem. Yeah. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest, but if you want it more for them than they want it for themselves, you're, you're wasting your time. Speaking of time, I have another interview coming up very shortly. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I really appreciate your having all of this insight. I know all of you guys tuning in and listening that this was profound and I encourage you to listen to it once for information, second time at least for transformation and more and more to digest all of this wonderful wisdom and insight. Peter was so generous to share with us. It was wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter, for being on the show. It was this amazing experience having you as a first guest and we are coming up soon with another amazing guest. I'm not going to say who it is, but it's going to be a wonderful surprise for you guys to tune in. How could people find out more about you? How, where can they find you? 
and uh, find I'm out pretty, about pretty, her. Pretty easy to find. Um, uh, if you go to my website, petersage.com, uh, I'm actually giving away my book right now, The Inside Track and See Behind Me, which I would actually say is probably the number one coaching Bible on the planet in terms of understanding human behavior, because when, when they, they go through that, they'll be given so many tools and insights on how I work at a super high level uh, in an environment that uh, most people don't get to operate in, uh, thankfully. And uh, you'll know more when you, you, you go into that. But yeah, uh, get on to uh, my world. I'm always giving out as much content as I can to help people, because that's my mission. You know, I'm very fortunate to be in a position where I made you know, way more money in business than uh, I'll ever make in selling books and coaching. So yeah, I do this because I'm passionate about wanting to help people and, uh, and therefore just giving out the information I can, uh, whatever. So if people have found some sort of benefit or insight in here, stay around my work. And uh, yes, between us, we'll see if we can make the world a better place. Absolutely. And I can definitely vouch and confirm what you just said about the book as I was a help with the process of uh, translating and creating an audio version of the book in Bulgarian language, which would be my own home language. And that was a wonderful experience because I had to go through the book on so many times that I like I have a deep, 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 uh, in, deeply ingrained in my consciousness now. And it's been significant. Thank you, Peter. Thank you guys for tuning in. It was great. And I will we'll see you again in a week or two with another amazing guest with wonderful insights. Outstanding. Thank you so much, my friend. Keep doing what you're doing.